Thank you for coming. Uh, we want to give you some updates of fun things going on at the university, and then it's always great to get uh, information and answer questions or try to answer questions for you. And Dr. Gevitz and I will be around afterwards, so if, there, if you need, some of you need to move on and get going, um, you know, there's always email uh, dropping by our offices and having those discussions, but we'll stay around after to make sure those that, that have questions that can stay, we can, we can answer all of your questions. So Dr. Gevitz, thank you for joining me today, just uh, getting in from uh, uh, the West yesterday, so thanks for getting your schedule going. I want to thank you for a great mock site visit. Uh, we had a great turnout, I think, on both campuses. The visitors were impressed, as people usually are, that everybody seems to understand the mission. It's a great mission. People are working together. People are looking toward the future, trying to be innovative, really looking at academic excellence, looking at scholarly activity and service. And so these are the things that they come in and check under the hood. We've had a lot of great documents prepared, so the argument is kind of going through its revision. They had a lot of wonderful comments on things that we can do to even improve our, our what we call our argument or defense or our case. And just reminding us that uh, in Mesa, Arizona, they'll be coming on November 9th. I believe that's a Friday, so they're going to start uh, in Arizona. Uh, they'll have site visitors there. And then uh, over the weekend, uh, they'll be coming here uh, for the 12th and 13th of November. And so this is, once again, uh, an exciting time for the university. So I think of it like a playoff game. Right, so we're really in a playoff mode. We're getting ready. This is a chance for you. We'll talk about this to tell them all the great things that you and your department have done. Right, and it's kind of that chance to take a listing of everything that's happened uh, in your world and to promote that and talk about it. You'll have an opportunity to review and comment on the insurance argument. Once we have the uh, site, mock site visitors suggestions incorporated, and we've had it looked at to make sure, you know, style and grammar and, and those types of things are appropriate. Then we'll have that available for your review. So you may want to look through it and you may have some specific things to, to comment on, although most of you uh, have probably participated in some way in that in developing the insurance argument. Once again, how can you help? Review the mission, vision, and strategic plan. So just review it. Be familiar with it. You don't have to memorize anything. Uh, but it's always nice if somebody can recite it. That's always fun. Uh, there's those savants in the room that can do those types of things. Uh, me, I have to kind of think through it when I, when I talk about the mission, vision, and um, the strategic planning. But please take time and familiarize yourself with it. You can go to our, our website uh, and, and connect to some of these different areas if you have the opportunity. Attend the forums and the meetings that you're invited to, right? So it's really important that you remind your managers and that you attend those forums because that is kind of the momentum that they see when they come on campus. So it's great for you to come. Once again, share your accomplishments, listen, respond. Uh, you know, think about things now that you have questions about so you can have those discussions with your managers and vice presidents. Uh, but once again, sh if you can show up to these things, they really get excited when they get to see uh, the faces of our faculty, staff, and students. So, so please make sure you're, you can attend when appropriate. Once again, don't be shy. Share your accomplishments. I know we're in the Midwest, and so we don't often talk about those things. And in Arizona, they have quite a few people that have moved there from the Midwest. So once again, it's something that we're usually uncomfortable about. But I think you know, one thing the mock site visitor said was, you know, toot your horn a little bit. Talk about the great things that you've done. Talk about the accomplishments of the university. Um, and once again, prepare to celebrate the outcome, whatever, whatever the outcome is, right? So we hope that we get the highest outcome, and we want to come back, and we want to celebrate, we want to reflect on it, learn from it. Once again, like a playoff game, you always learn what your strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, and once again, this is just a snapshot in time. And so we use that information, uh, subjective and objective information, to improve and continue to be a great university. Dr. Givitz will talk more, I think, about what's going on accreditation-wise in our programs. So a little bit about ATSU, we have 796 full-time employees. Isn't that amazing? We have 1,097 part-time, which equate to 976 FTEs, so almost 1,000 FTEs. So you think about the university and, and what it's doing. Students, about once again, about 3,000 full-time, about 1,000 part-time, and about 4,000 total. So once again, the work that you do and the way that you're able to coordinate all this stuff is pretty special and pretty amazing. 
patient visits in our clinics, we have over 100,000 patient visits. Once again, we'll have that, more of that data as we get all the final numbers for the year. And we offer 42 degree and certificate programs. Once again, sometimes I don't even realize this data until we sit down and we prepare it for an end of a year report or an annual report or for an accreditation visit. So I think you can be really proud of all the things that, uh, that happen here and are accomplished here. So congratulations again. We have a vision. Dr. Gevitz gave a great update on the vision a couple years ago. We're doing a lot of these things. People thought, oh, you'll never be able to do this type of thing. Leading innovator in health professions education, we can talk about how each of our schools and each of our programs are being innovative. You think about the ultrasound curriculum. You think about the new dental model uh, on our campuses. You think about COGS and the unique programs that they have. And then, of course, our Arizona pro location programs are also pretty innovative and special. And we can point to a lot of achievements. Superior students and graduate who exemplify and support the mission. Well, when they come back for graduation, you get a chance to see them. And then I get to see them, and many of the faculty and staff get to see them when we go out to alumni events. And uh, it's pretty incredible. So even when we visit with alumni from the 60s, right? So some of you young folks from the 60s, my gosh, we hadn't even landed on the moon by then, right? Um, they are still excited about the university and what it contributed to their life and to their career. So we know that we really have made a difference in the delivery of health care, and our graduates do well. They, they do very well in their residencies, and they do very well when they go out and look for jobs. And I hear it over and over again that our students, uh, during the clinical rotations, I heard from a physician that graduated from another school who educates our students yesterday who said, I'm so happy when the KCM students come because they are so much better than he named the five other DO schools that he works with. Osteopathic philosophy demonstrated and integrated. I think that's part of our DNA. We always have to make sure that we're thinking about that. <clears throat> I think we routinely talk about that. And then pioneer contributions to healthcare education, knowledge, and practice. And once again, this is our faculty developing innovative ways uh, as a teaching and learning institution, showing the way, publicizing, going for unique grants and things that meet us. Our mission, there's think about it as three parts. Quality education, scholarly activity, and service. So scar activity is improving the knowledge within certain fields, particularly in a faculty area's fields. And so there's a number of ways that scholarly activity occurs. I think you just may commonly know it as a term called research, right? So education, scholarly activity, and service. Service means things we do in the community. So we want all of our faculty, and we love all of our staff to be thinking in those terms. How are they contributing to the academic mission? How are they contributing to the scholarly activity mission and to the service? Then we have a couple themes within that, and one is that osteopathic philosophy and the tenets of osteopathic medicine, and the other is underserved communities. So kind of three main components, osteopathic tenets and osteopathic philosophy, and then underserved communities. So if you kind of remember those five points in some way, then that helps you understand the mission. We have a strategic plan with themes. We're not going to go through those, but if you get a chance to review them. And then in 2718, we focused on some areas. HLC accreditation, once again, some amazing things. Our CPAs, the mock site visitors commented that our core professional attributes, being able to demonstrate those in the curriculum of each program was pretty amazing. And so we can feel good that our, candidate, our, our, our students and our graduates have some common themes. And that came about with a discussion years and years ago with the accreditors that said, what's unique about AT Still University? Why would we want to hire one of those graduates why would anybody want to hire one of your graduates or give them a residency spot as opposed to others? And it came down to this idea of the things that make us unique. So the mission statement talks about it, and our core professional attributes talk about it. Opportunities to lead the way in wellness and prevention through our healthcare delivery centers. Dr. Gevitz and, Doc, and, and, and Counselor uh, Matt Heron have been working really hard on this to develop policies and procedures and things that uh, will be consistent throughout our clinics so we know that patients are being uh, treated in the same way, and our faculty and staff are able to deliver care at the highest level of quality. And that was a two-year initiative. We'll talk about it in this year. And then IT, we learned a lot about IT. And those of you heard the stories know it's scary out there. Uh, you know, we just have to continue to be vigilant. Fortunately, we have a wonderful IT group, and we have faculty and staff that are part of our um, IT initiatives and our safety initiatives. Uh, but we all need to take kind of responsibility of that and be very, very careful. So I was at a cybersecurity meeting we talked about before, phishing. About 60, 70% are all things that you, the employees usually do 
within an organization that compromise the integrity of, of the system. So opening up those emails that look, uh, that, that may be suspicious. One thing they do is uh, go on campuses and put hard drives. They throw them around with the university logo on it, and people pick them up, and what do they do with them? Plug it into their computer, right? And it affects the computer, right? So different things that we need to be vigilant about and think about so we can preserve the integrity of our IT systems. Uh, we, have we developed an insurance coverage this year for that IT. So, you know, in the past they just kind of made up what IT insurance was. You know, the guys who started it and women admitted that. Now we have some insurance, so if something happens, uh, we're protected. And then we're uh, advancing our software in our finance department and in our advancement department. And uh, those things should give us better integrity and consistency in the system. This year, uh, we're looking at, uh, once again, student experiences. This is always a concern, right? Our students are going to have, are they going to have enough clinical experiences, whether it's in a clinic, the patient, the variety of the patient, the number of the patients, or whether it's rotation-wise, hospital rotations, clinic rotations, athletic training rotations, whatever those things are, are there going to be enough of them? And about five years ago, um, Dr. Gevitz and Goldstein did a really thorough analysis and look. For instance, some accreditations require you have about 125% or 110% of what you need. And so they created a pretty thorough uh, look and organization a few years ago. And they'll update that again this year so we know where our strengths and weaknesses are as far as our student clinical and rotational experiences. So that was something that uh, the university said, hey, we, we need to check that again through the UAC committee and through others. Exploring opportunities to further ATSU's branding and marketing, right? So we're in a unique situation that we have more people that come to us than we can possibly take in our programs, right? So we have to be pretty strategic on branding and marketing because you only make more people upset, right? And believe me, I get these phone calls all the time. How come so-and-so didn't get in? How come my daughter, my son, or my niece, nephew, da 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 didn't get in? And so we have to think about branding and marketing in a way that, that elevates the university. We, we don't necessarily need more applicants in our programs, we might need a different type of applicant, right, that's committed to the mission, vision, and has quality education, and brings the things that we need a student to bring to the community. Uh, we might need in some of our programs, particularly online, we'd like to grow those programs too. And so branding and marketing is different for a university than it would be for a retail chain or a service company like an insurance company or a hotel or those type of industries. So this year we're going to bring in somebody to really view the campuses and look and talk about what branding means and what we need to do to kind of make sure we're up to our standards, right, which are the standards that protect the university, protect you and protect our students and protect our alumni and our future alumni. So that'll be an initiative that we talk about this year. And then we expect at the end of this fiscal year we should have a white paper kind of outlining some opportunities and options for us. So, you know, you can spend as much as you want on it. We had somebody come in in Arizona many, many years ago and they did a thorough analysis of the metropolitan area to find out how much it would cost so everybody in the Phoenix area would know about ATSU. And it was about $6 million to start and then about $2 million every year after that. Well, obviously that's not going to work right? because that's student tuition dollars that we're using. So we have to come up with other strategies and other ways to think about that and do that. Uh, continuing developing our patient care centers once again. Uh, boy, crazy year. I mean, you look at USC, you look at Oklahoma, you look at Michigan State. You look at all these areas where there's a lot of risk in delivering care to people. And uh, I think the risk committee identified this a couple years ago as one of the priorities, and we've kind of moved that up and continue to move that up. But for instance, are our documents the same at our Arizona Audiology Clinic as they are in our other clinics, right? Guten Song uh, Center and these other areas. And are they consistent and do they cover all the legal things? Do we have proper chaperoning guidelines? We have all the things in place that are really important, right, for patient, students, faculty, and staff, and the public in areas that we deliver care. And so when you think about it, this is part of our university. It's really grown into a significant part of the budget and significant part of our opportunities as well as our challenges and risk. A lot of professional development opportunities. I won't go through these, but uh, thank you for bringing these ideas forward. So everything from the leadership kind of management uh, initiative with uh, Missouri, University of Missouri, to our lynda.com, to all the training that's done by, all the education that's done by our HR folks. And then remember that within your groups, you have the opportunity to bring ideas forward. So what I like to tell folks to do is within your areas or across areas, are there skills and things that you want to learn about 
And if so, let us know. Bring those to the HR folks, and then we can budget appropriately. So whether it's learning how to use a piece of software, whether it's learning about how to handle difficult presidents and vice presidents, whatever that is, right, how to be customer service friendly, whatever, whatever that is, we can prioritize these things, and then we can bring that experience to you, either delivered online, in person, or study groups, kind of whatever, whatever you need to get your job done and to grow and develop. And so these are just a list of few of the things that we do, both for our faculty and for our staff, and Dr. Gevitz will probably talk a little bit about that. Once again, some more things that allow us opportunities to grow. Our health plan, uh, once again, a lot of benefits there. You've heard me talk about before, this year we're approaching $10 million in healthcare expenses, 10 million. So that's a lot of students we have to take care of to get our health insurance paid for, right? So if, they, if that keeps growing at the rate that it's been growing, eventually every dollar we take in tuition will go to our health care, right? Because it'll just gobble up the budget over time. So what we'll be doing kind of maybe, you know, after HLC is holding some small groups and large group uh, meetings to get your ideas on better things that we can provide, ways that we can do to keep our population as healthy as possible and to maximize those benefits uh, and, and look at that as really now an important part, an important expense of our, of our university. Uh, some of the other things that we've done, the telemedicine and the list of other benefits that we've, we've managed to uh, hopefully negotiate uh, in good faith and continue to use uh, with our health insurance. And once again, some employee benefit things. Uh, one, one area we were able to identify was a bachelor's degree completion bonus. That's something that you have been asking for for, for many, many years. And uh, we're able to now come up with a, a way that we can you know, cost effectively provide that and, and it's affordable for the university. Once again, keeping in mind that all this comes from tuition dollars. So every time we, we do something, we have to think, all right, how much are we going to have to raise student tuition to pay for it? Right? So we have to really be strategic when we think about these different things. So Dr. Gevitz will talk, I think, a little bit more about the faculty. And then once again, uh, there's usually development funds within department budgets uh, to, to work with uh, your, your supervisors and your managers to develop those things. Facilities, what's going on? Well, the TBR, uh, we're beginning a three-year process of understanding the needs of faculty in the future for scholarly activity, not necessarily the ones that are like me. But what is the next generation going to need? You know, what, is the, what are the students coming out in the future going to need as far as a research facility? You know, is it going to be more about the bandwidth? Is it going to be more about common spaces and shared spaces? Is it going to be more about focusing on genetics and genomics? Is it going to be whatever? And so our faculty are working with an architectural firm, Canada Design, who helped do this building, to come up with kind of an idea of what that should look in the future like in the future. So that'll take about a year to go through that and work with our faculty and have those discussions. And then some time to say, okay, you know, wow, you know, we, we want, we want a, a, a Tesla super fast sports car. We can probably afford the three, right? Or, you know, whatever, you know, something along those lines. And then we have a discussion about, okay, you know, how do we think that fits into our student tuition dollars and our opportunities to fundraise? So that'll go on for about a year, and then we'd like to take about a year and, and try to go out and raise funds for that. Go to our alumni and say, hey, this is the heritage, heritage campus of osteopathic medicine. The TBR building was built 50 years ago, 60 years ago, and really needs either a renovation, an addition, or a new building. And then we hope to that year secure funds through grants and gifts and other areas to be able to, to um, upgrade or, or build a new uh, area for scholarly activity for our faculty and students and staff to work together. Uh, Memorial Hall, we're adding an elevator and uh, uh, upgrading some bathrooms this year. And so those of you who uh, f have the opportunity to go down in that area know that some of it hasn't changed since I was a student, which was a long time ago. And uh, so those are the two big projects, and these are pretty big projects that are going to go on. So at the end of this fiscal year, we should have some uh, restroom upgrades, and we should have a an elevator that allows uh, that west side of that building to be accessible for everybody at Memorial Hall. Twin Pines Nursing Home, many of you know that that's going to become vacant over time. And we're trying to work with the city and others to find out, you know, what, what could that be? What's going on with it? We're looking at environmental studies. We're looking at structural studies. We're looking at uh, the quasi-government organization that, that owns it now. We're looking at any Russian meddling in the uh, Twin Pines Nursing Home. 
uh, and we hope that, uh, that we come up with a way forward to make sure that since that's adjacent and between two of our properties, right, St. Andrews and our, um, our um, TCC, that we become good stewards of, of what that, that could be down the road. You know, we, 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 we're not necessarily opposed to it being something, but we prefer that it not be the next Anheuser-Busch distribution center, right? I think that's, I think we all can see that one. All right, IPE uh, building uh, here. We're getting ready to accommodate uh, some additional uh, students in Mosdo, and we've got a way forward and a plan for that. Uh, the TCC upgrades, uh, thank you. We had over 177 people pledge already over almost $120,000 to upgrade the TCC in the area where the court is and, and kind of in that environment on that side, on what we would say the north side of that. And so thanks everybody for, for pitching in on that. Uh, those gifts come in over a five-year period, and I think this morning they had 77,000 or something like that come in. And so they have the additional, I think it's 40,000 or so coming in. And then once that money comes in, then we can start the upgrades of the, of the court portion or the gym portion of the TCC. So that's kind of very, very exciting. And this was uh, mainly gifts from employees and a lot from alumni who said, you know what, when I was at Kirksville, that place meant a lot to me. And Dan Martin and the folks that worked there meant a lot to me. And I'm willing to step forward and donate ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars 30000 dollars for that. We're working on a seventy thousand kind of dollar wrap-up gift from one of our alumni spouses. So uh, that's the TCC and the Dan Martin Court. And then of course the St. Louis Dental Center uh, will be welcoming in 20, 21 the uh, increase in the class size in St. Louis. So we'll be working with them on plans to make sure that we can uh, have those students welcome and a place for them to get years three and four done. Uh, the Interprofessional and Culture Proficient Standardized Patient Experience Center uh, is in the planning stage in Arizona. This weekend, fingers crossed, um, Dr. Morgan and uh, Dr. Uh, George are in, uh, will be in Chicago talking about the expansion of the SOMA. So they're going from 100 to 150, kind of 160 with that, with that wiggle room. So think about that. That's a big lift, right? So if we asked everybody in here to increase their class sizes by 50%, that's a big lift. Uh, but these the sumo folks are amazing. They buckled down. They they've gotten excited about it. They understand their mission, their purpose, the university's mission and purpose. They understand soma is one of the models of where med uh, medical education is going, and they've actually developed it on an existing footprint that uses very little additional space. And so they have really been super amazing in the development of this. And I think that you know that footprint and the way that that will be able to be accomplished once again, becomes a model as we think about the tuition responsibility on students and how that affects their ability to, to choose careers and move forward. So this is part of that. We're having a standardized patient center. Uh, they don't quite have the nice simulation center that they have here. Uh, and they've chosen, because students are only there for one year, uh, that uh, they want to kind of put their backing behind a, a, a kind of a world-class standardized patient center, like you have a world-class patient simulation center here. And so that's kind of the the direction they're going. Just so happens that a large orthopedic group that rented space uh, will no longer require that space and it actually fits out to be a really beautiful standardized patient center. And so once again, without having to spend a lot of money on construction and cost, we can go in and make some improvements and, and turn that into a, a, a interprofessional for all of our groups in Arizona. Uh, sites search and lease for our California campus location, if, you, if you've heard about it, ad nauseum for seven or eight, nine, ten years. <laughs> Uh, we got in the queue for a PA program that takes five to seven years. So you get in line, and then you hope over time that you know things happen and that uh, that everybody progresses through. And so we think, if everything goes as planned in 2020, we'll be op we'll be um, having a class of 100 physician assistants in California. People say why California, and, and the answer is pretty simple: fifth largest economy in the world, responsible for over one percent of U.S. GDP, one one state. Uh, there is a dearth of universities for students in California and even a greater dearth of health professions opportunities for California residents. So you take all that together, right, and you find the right community at the right cost with the right support, which we've gotten through grants as far as the curriculum and, and development of clinical rotations. And uh, you pick a program that works financially fairly early on, and then we hopefully have set Kirksville up for the next 20 years. So someday as we think now, wow, Arizona, thank goodness we invested there, hopefully down the road we say, all right, 
Thank goodness we invested in California. And the time to invest is when everybody else is afraid, right? St. Louis, right? Arizona. All these were stories of, oh my God, who would go to downtown St. Louis after Ferguson? Who would go to California, right? It's too crazy to do business there. Nobody should go there. Who would go to Arizona? Oh my gosh, you're going to be taken over by people coming from Mexico. I mean, I heard all these stories, right? You know, And now we look back and we say, thank goodness we, we risked. Thank goodness we were innovative. Thank goodness we did these things because all the eggs in one basket we know just doesn't work. Uh, uh, once again, accommodations planning for college school and program growth. Dr. Gevitz is working with each program to talk about growth. And anybody who gets a chance to review things knows that if you're not growing in some way, if, in, especially in universities, if you're not shooting for that 3 to 4% margin, if you're not shooting for program growth, eventually you decay and you become insignificant. So I had a college president call me and said, listen, Craig, I want you to know we're doing these things. And he says, you, KCOM, ATSU, is the Ashburn University. And because we waited so long to do these things, we are so far behind. Number one, we'll probably never catch up. And number two, now we're having to make decisions and do things because we're being forced to, not because we thought it out and that we really want to, right? So there's a number of health professions universities that are now under this gun where they've invested in a single product line, where they've invested some of these 100 years old universities that haven't diversified geographically or with programs, and they're, and, and, and they're really, really going to be hurting. And so thankfully, for, uh, past leadership has, has planned some of these things and discussed these things. So. Hey, how many of you went to Mission of Mercy? Pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you. This was a big deal. Um, unfortunately, we had ASDO graduation. No, no. Ash's graduation the day before. We had eight graduations, I think, this year. But we had the graduation for our second Ashes group on that Friday. And so other, other than hiring a private jet to get here, which I don't recommend any president do, uh, except for the United States, uh, I was, there was no way we could make it. But thank you. It, this was sounded out throughout the country. Our board members heard about it. Our faculty, staff, students on both campuses heard about it. Approximately 1,200 underserved adults and children received over 815,000 worth of free dental care. You should be proud in this community. Uh, you know, people say, what can I do? Can I make a difference? You know, well, when you went down there and you saw these folks standing in line the night before in pain, right, people crying, uh, when you saw people able to step up and it may have been someone who simply did a registration or a welcoming or you know, cleaned up afterwards uh, was a pretty amazing thing. So they describe how the community, AH, ATSU and TSU worked together. And at the end of the, end of the second day, everybody was so tired. But you know what? They were inspired. They were, wanted to pick up and they wanted to put things away and they wanted to thank these folks and get on to the next thing. And it was amazing. The TSU football team came in in their Mo Mom shirts and lifted that whole place up and cleaned it out in, in a short period of time. But the fact that the football team was there doing it, and the fact that you as citizens in Kirksville were there giving of your time to help these people that were really in pain and suffering. Very few times can you go do something that at the end of an hour, you can say, wow, that made a difference in that person's life. You know, we took something out of there that was potentially going to kill them through sepsis. We relieved some pain. We helped the family. We helped the community. We helped the region. And we helped another human being. So thank you for everybody that did that. They had over 800 volunteers, and this was a, was a really big, big deal. Once again, cleanings and fillings and 1,729 extractions. I mean, that just makes me want to pass out. <laughs> All right, you have the ATSU idea box. Uh, remember that. A couple other fun things uh, to, to mention. Uh, and if you, we get some great suggestions. We try to do as many as we can, or we kind of put them on what we call kind of the future list. And we appreciate that. We also have a fraud hotline for if things are not going the way someone thinks they should be going or they're suspicious of something, uh, that's available to us too. Once again, our checks and balances within the system. I'm going to uh, have Dr. Gevitz come up and uh, get the second part of the Siegfried and Roy um, Act. But, uh, oh, you got your own. Very nice. Very nice. So the president noted when he started out that ATSU was built upon Midwestern values. Um, I grew up in New York, but fortunately, my wise guy persona was moderated by living most of my life in the Midwest. Um, but when, when the president said we have to brand ATSU, my New York persona came back to me, and so I had a slogan, 
ATSU, what's there not to like? And because of that, the president has decided to hire a consultant <laughs> anyway. But I did try. Um, one of the things when I came here a little more than five years ago that I was asked to do was to promote what was called universitization. And the idea was that um, 10 years ago when we were previously accredited by HLC, they noted that we were uh, basically a university that represented the sum of its parts. That we weren't essentially a coherent whole. Whatever the colleges did would filter up but there was no real unifying themes. And so the idea was for us to become a university in terms of its processes, to make sure that there was equity across the various schools and colleges and programs as much as possible. And um, I would say that one of the things that the um, mock site visitors said was that we have accomplished a great deal, uh, particularly in terms of shared governance, in terms of equity, in terms of university standards and university programs. Um, we have our staff council. We have also the university faculty senate. We have the council of deans. Um, and what we have tried to do, uh, not always with success, but we're still out there trying, is to improve the communication lines and also the decision making so that um, decisions are more transparent, um, that people participate in decisions, and that there is better communication. One of the things that, when I said, what's there not to like? That basically was the attitude of the site visitors when they interacted with all of you. That um, they couldn't get over, in a sense, how many of you participated in the open forums, that answered their questions, that they used the word that your faculty and staff are authentic. That is, they felt that you weren't putting on an act that you were revealing to them the strengths and, in some cases, the limitations um, here at ATSU, and that they enjoyed interacting with you. And they felt that, that wow, one of the things that, that you have is just a wonderful number of employees who basically participate in a process. And all of the mock site visitors are real site visitors and were telling us that uh, in terms of their experience that they thought that this place was remarkable in many ways. And that was reflected in the comments they had uh, with respect to revising our self-study and how we present for um, the actual site visitors. So I want to thank you as the president has for participating in that as we go forward. So again, going back to the theme of universitization, but also in terms of sharing, that one of the things that I noticed when I first came here and that was implemented um, soon after was the interaction between KCOM and MOSDO in terms of basic scientists participating in MOSDO's educational programs. And that was and is vital to the success of MOSDO. And what I'm hoping is that the teaching that goes on, that research will develop uh, between uh, individuals who are connected to both of our schools. Um, one of the articles that I wrote uh, now more than 25 years ago was on the stomatolo stomatological movement in dentistry. And that is that uh, dentists were seen as having a broader role in healthcare than just simply um, extractions or whatever, that they were the physicians of the mouth. Um, and at the turn of the 20th century, uh, many dentists also had um, MD degrees as well. But then, then there became this siloed effect between schools. 
and that dentistry went its way and medicine went its way. And, and what now we're seeing in terms of the professions is that greater interaction, uh, including interprofessional education. And now we see um, ATSU, KCOM, and, and MOSDO um, interacting with one another, uh, both in the curriculum and in the co-curriculum in terms of activities. I want to I, I talk about five things that have been accomplished uh, basically by working uh, with the University Faculty Senate and the President that has, I think, moved the academic process forward. Um, the first is the university promotions document. This was done when Neil was um, uh, president of the, Senate, of the chair of the University Faculty Senate. Um, and this was based upon Boyer's work, and there were many different types of scholarships. And now we have a document that covers all of the schools, all of the programs, different types of research. And it is a document that, that we're proud of, that, that really reflects who we are as an institution. The second item uh, has to do with contracts. And as faculty who have been here a long time know, that they were operating under a two-year rolling contract. And that created certain issues in terms of um, commitment by the institution, um, in terms of uh, faculty. And what we did was to go to a three-year rolling contract um, with the specifics in terms of what it would take to be renewed. And so um, without having a... Um, historic tenure system per se, that there were enough safeguards in the three-year contract that faculty would feel more comfortable um, and that um, this was an important uh, improvement in terms of our relationship with our faculty and basically guarantees to our faculty about their continuation for employment. The third item has to do with professional development funds. I was made aware that each college was completely different in terms of the amount of money that they awarded to their full-time faculty. It ranged from one school that gave $1,100 to KCOM, which gave $2,500 per full-time faculty, faculty member for professional development. And in the process of universitization, faculty is faculty whether you're in one school or another school, whether you're in one program or another program, we should be, you as faculty should be treated equally. And so we were able to work with finance and the president to make sure that all full-time faculty members receive $2,500 in professional development funds. Fourth area is just this past year. Working with the University Faculty Senate we have developed, it's called a tenure policy. It's not tenure in the historic sense of tenure, but it does mean something more than the tenure policy that we had in effect uh, previously, which only two school uh, faculty members were eligible for, KCOM and ASHES. Under this policy, all schools, all full-time faculty members are eligible under this contract. And for those who achieve tenure or who already had tenure, it means an additional $2,000 to be spent in a given year towards professional development. So in addition to the $2,500 that all faculty, uh, full-time faculty receive, an additional $2,000. So for those of you who are tenured, you should feel pretty good that you have $4,500 a year um, to spend on professional development. And for those of you who yet do not have tenure, it gives you an incentive now to get tenure. So I think this is an important um, improvement because now all faculty, all full-time faculty are eligible for this program. The fifth item has to do with a university faculty handbook. We now, at long last, working on this since 2010, right, Neil? have a university faculty handbook, and it has been posted. 
And I can't tell you how important this is basically for the Higher Learning Commission. This is, this is one of the essential documents that we have or need to have. Is it perfect? No. We realize this. Um, we did as best we could. And already the University Faculty Senate is working on revisions to that handbook. But it shows that we are moving towards universitization. We're moving towards equality. We're moving towards equity. And we're trying to move forward. So I'd like to thank all of you, uh, faculty and staff, for your efforts to move the ball forward. I think the, the long list that the president gave of what we're doing here, I think it really, I think it really justifies my slogan. ATSU, what's there not to like? Thank you very much. Good, and I, and I think I didn't see Dr. Hurd here, but congratulations, Dr. Hurd, and all the staff and all the things that they do, uh, our communications and marketing folks. And I run the risk of doing what Dr. Gevitz did uh, a while back, right, and, and leave out a group, right? So, you know, I'm looking around IT, all of our different schools, um, advancement. Do we have some folks from advancement here? So, those of you that don't think each day you make a difference, uh, about two months ago, on a Friday, I get a call from Sean Summer. He says, I really don't like to bother you late in the afternoon on a Friday. I happen to be in Kirksville. And I said, yeah, no problem. Um, he said, I just want to call you with some good news because it's amazing how oftentimes we get called with other type of news. <laughs> and he goes, I just thought I'd make your Friday. He said, yes. I said, I said great. So we got a call from an attorney in Clearwater, Florida, who said, uh, by the way, uh, we're settling an estate, and one of your alums' sons just left A.T. Still University $1.2 million. And so, wow, said, that's pretty good Friday news, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so this, this attorney will be coming to the AOA meeting in San Diego during the alumni reception to present the check to the university. So a little bit story. So this young man's father graduated from ATSU in case we went in 1965. So imagine that. He had a son whose son ended up, uh, I think, being a moderately successful professional golfer, but I don't think he was a top-tier golfer. And he passed away at a, at a little younger age than I think anybody anticipated. But the father had left a, tr a trust fund for his spouse and the son. And as the son passed away in 2014, he went back and said, I want to leave half the estate to my father's medical school that he went to and then half to St. Jude's Children's Hospital. So each day, we, sometimes we know we're, our students are treating tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients a day. We kind of get that, but sometimes we forget that a little something that we might have done or somebody might have done affects the sons and daughters, and I get to have dinner with these folks on a frequent basis, and in their heart, they remember something that their dad said or their mom said while well, they were students here, and it triggers this next generation who's not even involved in healthcare to think, boy, that really made an impact on our family, and I want to thank them. So each day, kind of remember kind of the great things that you're doing. Questions? Dr. Gavitz, this is where you come in. No. Any, any questions? Like you said, we're tr we try to be transparent. Uh, we have a great um, staff um, committee and, and staff uh, group that get together and advise uh, the uh, HR and the president on some ideas. We have an incredible faculty senate. Their representative sits in all of our cabinet meetings at the university level. Um, but any questions that you have? Yes, Dr. Chamberlain. I was curious about California. Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. So two parts. First part is where, right? So in the past, we've kind of talked about San Diego a lot, right? 10 years ago or 15 years ago when we were on this journey, San Diego was kind of a place where, you know, it was up and coming. Well, it got there, right? It kind of filled up. And uh, the price of housing, which we all know in San Diego, and, 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 and traffic and student housing and faculty housing, if you've been there, is off the chart. So once again, if you've ever read a book called Blue Ocean Strategy, it's really a great book. There's a new volume out. But what it says is that, and they advise big companies, is to kind of think about the red ocean where everybody's in there fighting and grinding and, and, and doing things. Look for a blue ocean. So you know, that kind of strategy works, especially for the DO profession, right? It's, a, it's kind of a blue ocean profession. The way we do our clinical rotations and SOMA model, the MOSDO model, KCOM's model, is we try to do things in a different way. So we actually looked at, a, at 
areas up the coast. And we identified a giant community health center, and I mean big health center, that spans from San Luis Obispo to Santa Barbara. And I believe has something like 40 locations and treats over 120,000 patients. And we thought, hmm, boy, we have graduates working there. We have students rotating there. Perhaps we should investigate this part of the country. So we did uh, uh, several visits. We brought a board member out there whose specialty is in real estate and is on the real estate committee. We'll be bringing our board chair and other board members there in September. And uh, we're looking at a location called Santa Maria, California. So Santa Maria is kind of a hidden gem on the Central Coast. The Central Coast is a couple hours south of San Francisco and a couple hours north of LA. And when our board member went there, he said this reminds him of, he went to Stanford, this reminds him of Palo Alto 30 years ago. So you have these wide agricultural swaths of land, tens of thousands of agriculture acres. Uh, you have um, Silicon Valley folks coming down and staking out claims and looking at areas. You have housing that's about 200,000 less than other parts of California. Uh, and even though it sounds really expensive to us, you can get a brand new home there in the 500s, which is pretty unheard of in, in some of these types of uh, California and urban areas. And student housing, the, the apartments are about the same as they are in Mesa. And so this has a lot of ideas and makes sense. So many of you know we've been in the queue for PA, so we'll start hopefully with 100 PA students. So that first year will be 100 PA students. then. Year two will be 100 PA students. The second year students will be out at 20 health centers across the country. So they'll be out and, uh, in, in different health centers as groups of five. And then uh, the next uh, item will be bringing all the stakeholders, to get, stakeholders together in that area and say, what does the city need? What does the region need? What does our country need? What's, what are the future professions that, that we're going to need? And then like we did in Mesa, we hope over time to add different programs to that depending on what the need is. But uh, we have a unique opportunity. The National Institute Community Health Centers have, have committed over half a million dollars for the development of this program and other and, and related recruiting. So they've paid for basically uh, a um, Don Weaver, a former uh, assistant, um, I think he was Secretary of Health, yeah, Surgeon General, and he has been out cultivating the clinical rotation sites. And then we have over $100,000 that they put toward the curriculum development. So the community health centers have really come up to the table and have in invested about $5 million, and, and they're on track to hopefully invest another $1.5 in the in the California Opportunity Campus. The nice thing is PA program, it's two years. It doesn't require a significant amount of infrastructure investment. So we would be able to, for instance, lease a space uh, and not have all that uh, significant capital development. And then the nice thing is with 100 students within a couple years, it generates revenue for the overall university. Because once again, it's a different model than medicine and dentistry. It's a little bit more cost effective to get up and running. And once again, like all of our programs, the list of applicants, quality applicants, far exceeds the capacity. And uh, you know, I, I think about my son, I think, wow, you know, he's, he's young, he's, he's 10, but someday he may want to go to school. Are, are there going to be opportunities for him? Is he going to have to go out of the country? Is he going to have to go some other place if he decides he wants to be in the health professions? Because we simply do not have enough positions for all the qualified applicants and tremendous need uh, in the country. So thank you. Did that answer it? Good. Other questions? Good. What a quiet group. Good. Uh, any questions for Dr. Gibbons? All right, we'll be here. So if you, afterwards you want to come on up and ask some. Oh, yes. Did you have a question? Or are you just holding that thing? Darn it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> Very good. All right, well, listen, thank you, everybody. And uh, like I said, we're available whenever you need us. And appreciate all that you do. Thank you.